Welcome to Mayo Clinic Sleep Medicine Podcasts, a series for physicians, advanced practice providers, nurses, and other health practitioners treating sleep disorders or interested in learning about state-of-the-art advances in sleep medicine and sleep health. I'm your host, Dr. Michael Silber. And I'm your co-host, Dr. Maitri Juna. We are both consultants at the Center for Sleep Medicine at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Thank you all for joining us for today's podcast titled RLS and the Use of Opioids. The overprescription of opioids for chronic pain has led to an understandable concern about the long-term prescription of opioids for other disorders. Yet experts in restless leg syndrome do recommend their use for patients with refractory restless legs. It is important for practitioners treating the disorder to understand the indications for opioid use and how they can be used safely. My guest today is Dr. Michael Silber, Professor of Neurology at the Mayo Clinic College of Medicine and Science and a board-certified sleep specialist. Mike, when do you prescribe opioids for patients with restless leg syndrome? Well, the indication for opioids is refractory restless legs, which really is defined as patients who failed both alpha-2 delta ligands, such as gabapentin or pregabalin, or, um, and also has failed dopamine agonists. The main reason why they failed alpha-2 delta ligands is either they just didn't work or they've got side effects that weren't tolerable. And the main reason for failing dopamine agonists is generally augmentation that I think we've discussed on a previous podcast. Um, the f- other factor before we call it utterly refractory is that iron status is checked, that iron levels are corrected and the patient who's got severe symptoms, severe augmentation, if the ferritin and the percentage transfer and saturation allow it, and intravenous iron infusion is given and hasn't helped, then we would consider the patient to be refractory. So which opioids do you usually start with and what regimen do you use? Do you have a preferred drug? Well, yes. my Most of my experience um, to start with has been with oxycodone. Now, the dose of oxycodone we use for restless legs, we generally would start at, say, 10 milligrams, um, sometimes even only 5 milligrams in older patients, but 10 milligrams generally. The average dose that somebody with restless legs needs is 20 milligrams, and the usual maximum is 30 milligrams. Now, if you convert these doses to um, morphine milligram equivalents, that's doses of 15 to 45 milligrams of morphine. That's important because most um, experts would say under 50 milligrams morphine equivalent, your risks of addiction and bad outcomes is much lower. So the doses we use are way below the doses that used to be used for chronic pain. Um, We start by giving the drug usually once a day before bed. Because it's a short-acting immediate release agent, sometimes patients will need a second dose during the night. They'll wake up, rest his legs back, and they have a second dose. If that's needed, I would much prefer to have them on a controlled release preparation to give them coverage through the night. And of course, there is controlled release oxycodone, um, which was marketed as and still is as oxycontin. But of course, that's the drug which has really got a bad reputation and many um, insurances won't pay for oxycontin anymore. So I found over the years a very nice equivalent if patients do need a longer acting drug is simple morphine controlled release. And there are a number of different forms of it. Again, the dose is slightly higher to get the correct um, morphine milligram equivalents. Usually it's a single dose of somewhere between 50, 15, I'm sorry, not 50, 15 and 30 milligrams. One can go up to 40 milligrams, um, but that's often if we have to use it twice a day to get people around the clock. So those are the drugs I usually start with, and we can talk about others as we go through. What side effects should we worry about when using opioids and how do you monitor your patients for these? 
Well, almost everybody gets constipation. If people are preventative with it, um, changes in diet, maybe using senna or something like lactulose, they usually manage to get through it pretty well on the low doses we use. Now, there are always some patients who have very refractory constipation on any opioids, and there's some newer drugs that can be used for that, but that's really rare in my experience. Nausea, the majority of my patients, it's doesn't occur or is very mild and very tolerable, but there are a couple of patients with very severe nausea. And we tr tr like to treat nausea with a drug like Ondansetron rather than a dopaminergic drug, a dopamine blocking drug for obvious reasons because we don't want to flare up the restless legs. And I've got a few patients who have failed absolutely everything, including the um, dopamine blocking drugs and where it's been very limiting in the use of opioids due to nausea. So that can be a serious problem. But again, it's a minority of of our patients. Some patients get itch. It's not an allergic reaction. It's due to mast cell degranulation, quite difficult to treat. What our patients generally do not get is excessive sleepiness because they're usually so horribly sleep deprived that when you give them the opioid before bed, they get great sleep for the first time maybe in months and that doesn't usually spill into the day, but it is a possible side effect, especially if you have to give another dose during the day. Cognitive impairment on waking in the morning can happen. Gait unsteadiness and falls during the night is a risk. And especially older people, we always say leave the lights on. If you've got to walk to the bathroom, hold on to furniture, and they may have to accept some risk there. Some patients get sexual dysfunction and increased sweating due to um, testosterone blockade. Um, that's not common, but it does happen. Overdose, addiction, we have to consider those risks. And all our patients, we use the opioid risk tool first to try estimate risk. It doesn't mean we don't give them to people who've got high risk, but we monitor them a lot more carefully. If you're using doses above 50 milligrams, morphine milligram equivalent daily, you should provide um, naloxone spray just in case of an overdose by the patient or some relative or friend who gets hold of the drug. And if there's any risk of that, maybe any patient should get it, but certainly if, that, if you're at above 50 milligrams. And then, of course, we never just prescribe opioids and send them out into um, the sunset to look after their opioids. We follow them carefully. What precautions do you take, Mike, to ensure that you're prescribing legally and ethically? Well, as I said, we first estimate risk. And if they're at high risk, we think carefully, do they really need it? We would always see back a patient a month after the initial prescription. We have a wonderful system in place in our sleep center at Mayo with our fantastic nurses who monitor every time a prescription is um, replaced. They look at the state monitoring um, uh, websites, the PDMP, they talk to the patients. And so we feel very comfortable seeing our patients back face to face only every six to 12 months once they're on a stable dose. But that's probably a little far out for most practitioners who don't have the system we have. But I really don't think most people need to come face to face every month. And some of the patients talk to me, they say it's so inconvenient, it's humiliating that the doctor insists that they come face to face to the practice to get every monthly prescription. And I think for for most patients, that's an unnecessary precaution. But we do get them all to sign an opioid contract, which basically says no early refills. Don't call us up and say, I lost the prescription or I lost the, the drug. Um, only one provider. And if we find you're getting opioids from a second provider, we will look very carefully into it. And often that's a very big warning sign. Don't take more than we've agreed on. If you feel it's not working, contact us and we'll mutually agree if necessary on an increase. Um, they know we check the state monitoring um, websites and we do urine drug screens at various intervals. Um, so those are the ways we do it. When we see patients back, we always assess for are they becoming dependent on the drug. So we're very careful. We look at it um, as these drugs are potentially harmful and we are going to check very carefully and be sure that we're using them safely, ethically, and legally. 
two opiates that are used for patients with opioid addiction disorder, both methadone and buprenorphine. These are sometimes prescribed for highly refractory restless legs. But most practitioners outside of addiction specialists have very little experience with them. Can you comment a little bit, Mike, on how you use these medications? Yes. Actually, there's a fair amount of data on methadone and restless legs, not controlled trials. There's a wonderful big controlled trial on oxycodone. Methadone, it's open label, but it's very effective in restless legs. But you've got to remember a few things about methadone. The first is it's a potent drug. Um, it's one to four ratio with morphine up to 20 milligrams. Above that, it becomes very difficult to use, and I would leave that to people with experience in managing drug addiction. So I don't usually go above a total daily dose of 20 milligrams. So we'd start at 2.5 or 5 milligrams, maybe sometimes higher depending what dose we're converting from of morphine or oxycodone. Um, there's, as I said, a 10-year study showing that at the end of 10 years, 80% of the patients were still on methadone without a huge increase in the drug. So it's effective long-term, at least in open-label studies. My own personal experience is that perhaps nausea is more common with methadone than with the other agents. Um, it can increase the QT interval, usually on higher doses than we use, but I always check the ECG and just be sure the patient doesn't have a family history of sudden death. Um, it's long acting. And therefore, we are especially concerned about sleep apnea with methadone. We need to be concerned about sleep apnea with any of the opioids. And if a person has sleep apnea, they must be well controlled before we put, I want to put them on any opioids. And I check that they continue to be well controlled. But with methadone, especially important. The other thing that opioids can do, and especially methadone, is to convert obstructive to central sleep apnea. So I always check a download within a month or so after starting the drug. If there's any out and overnight oximetry to just check that. So I'm always very um, cognizant of that. And the other thing, of course, with any opioids should not be con um, combined with alcohol, of course, and ideally should not be combined with benzodiazepines either, though there may be occasional exceptions to that with careful monitoring. Now, whereas there's a fair amount of evidence for methadone in the literature for restless legs, buprenorphine has not been used extensively. There are a couple of people around the country who've got a lot of experience with it, and I've spoken to them about it as well, and I've used it in a, in a number of refractory patients, and I think with time this may become a drug we're using more and more for restless legs, but we need published um, literature on it on people who've had a lot of experience with it. So buprenorphine is more becoming more commonly used for opioid addiction than methadone now. It's a mixed agonist antagonist. It's a partial mu receptor agonist, and it's a kappa receptor antagonist. So it's a little different from conventional opioids. Because there's an antagonism aspect to it, most people recommend stopping ordinary opioids somewhere between 12 and 24 hours before starting buprenorphine. And we tend to recommend that. Methadone being long acting, you may have to stop it a little longer, or you may even have to convert the patient back to oxycodone before starting buprenorphine. Um, there are a number of ways of giving buprenorphine, but I've used two ways. The one is the drug called Belbuca, which is a buccal film. It goes on the inside of the cheek, and it's very low dose, 75 to 150 micrograms. By the way, the doses of buprenorphine are totally different from the doses of all the other opioids, and you can't easily convert them to morphine milligram equivalents. But you can start, if you want, very low at 75 to 150 micrograms increase every five days until you get up to about 750 micrograms. Now, I've done this um, in patients who've been previously on opioids, and my experience has been it's, the dose is too low. Um, and probably it's okay to start at about 500 micrograms in people who've been on opioids before. Once we get up to about 500 or 750 micrograms and it's not enough, I convert to suboxone. And the reason is it's far, far cheaper. Suboxone is a sublingual film. It goes under the tongue as opposed to on the on the buccal mucosa. 
The lowest dose is two milligrams, but you can cut the film into half to get one milligram and even into a quarter to get 0.5 milligrams. So the only reason to start with Belbuca really is if you want to start very low and build up slowly. Otherwise, Suboxone can be used, as I say, from 0.5 milligrams upwards. Most people who've tried it for restless legs find efficacy in one to two milligrams, but it's been used up to six milligrams, usually in a single dose again before bed, but sometimes twice daily. Um, the suboxone form under the tongue has got naloxone combined with it, so it's a very safe way of doing it. Um, again, my personal experience of buprenorphine is limited, and I'm hoping that there'll be soon some big open-label studies published to give us more guidance, but I think we're going to hear more about buprenorphine for restless legs in the future. That's very helpful, Mike. Thank you for providing that detailed um, information on prescribing of some of those agents. Are there any final messages that you would like to leave with our listeners about opioids and restless legs? Yes. The first message would be, please, please don't withhold opioids in appropriate patients with refractory restless legs. There are some physicians out there quite understandably say, I will never again long use long-term opioids, but they're thinking about chronic pain and these patients deserve relief and it should be used in the correct patient but one has to understand how to use it, keep the doses low, follow the patients carefully. But in those, in these refractory patients, these may be, these opioids may be life transforming and they can use them long-term, usually without a great deal of tolerance. Now, just a personal note, I should say that at Mayo Clinic, it is our policy to only prescribe opioids for in-state patients generally just in our region. We've always been happy to give an opinion in a consultative practice, but for many reasons, we do not prescribe opioids for patients outside our state and, so, and if possible, outside our region. Nevertheless, we're always happy, happy to help. Thanks very much, Mike, and to our listeners for joining us for today's podcast. Thank you, my three. We hope you enjoyed this podcast. If so, please tune in again through wherever you receive your podcasts as we discuss further topics in sleep medicine and sleep health. Thank you.